So typically when someone refers to the Unix philosophy, they'll usually say it's something like write programs that do one thing and do it well. But the Unix philosophy is actually considerably more than this. So I thought it might be fun to go over the history of it and sort of explain where we're at now. Now the Unix philosophy isn't a formal design method, it's a pragmatic approach grounded in real world experience created from the bottom up, not created from the realms of theoretical computer science like things such as Agile, Waterfall or various other sort of design methodologies that are handed down from on high that try to address the way that software should be made. The Unix philosophy, however, was thought up by the Unix founders in the real world to address real world problems. And the originator of the Unix philosophy is believed to be Ken Thompson, who was one of the founding creators of the Unix operating system. And he thought it up as a way to create small capable operating systems that have a clean interface, but he never really laid it out as rules. That didn't happen until considerably later when Doug McIlroy, the inventor of Unix pipes, decided to actually lay this out properly. So the first rule is make each program do one thing well to do a new job, build afresh rather than complicating old programs by adding new features. So for example, let's say you have something like Fuzzy Finder. So you could build a Fuzzy Finder into your text editor, but you could also go and build a Fuzzy Finder as a separate application and then have some sort of interface between those two applications so that that tool can be used in other situations. And that's how FCF actually gets used. So you could use it as a Fuzzy Finder directly, or you could also go and integrate it into applications like say NeoVim. And the next rule is expect the output of every program to become the input to another as yet unknown program. Don't clutter the output with extraneous information, avoid stringently columnar or binary input formats, and don't insist on interactive input. And there's a lot to unpack there, but the first part of that can sort of be broken down to make sure that the output for an application is very simple, doesn't have extra information that it doesn't need, and for the input of an application, once again, make sure it's also simple and doesn't rely on some proprietary format. And as for the last part, don't insist on interactive input, now this isn't to necessarily say that interactive input is bad, however the application should have some way to have raw input and output so it can be put into a piping system. The next rule is design and build software, even operating systems, to be tried early, ideally within weeks. Don't hesitate to throw away the clumsy parts and rebuild them. So this basically means when you're building software, try and build a skeleton framework so you actually can go and test it rather than building all of the individual parts that might be useful and then trying to basically glue them together. And this just makes it so you know that the framework actually works and then as you need to add features to it, it's much, much easier to go and test. And the last rule is use tools in preference to unskilled help to lighten a programming task, even if you have to detour to build the tools and expect to throw some of them out after you've finished using them. So this can effectively be summed up as code generation. If you can automate a process, then go and automate the process. Don't try to manually write it out just because that's what you've always done. And that can also be extended to data processing as well. So even though you could go and process a 10,000 line CSV file, if you can automate the process, then you should automate the process. Now this is probably longer than any Unix philosophy that you've heard about, and that's because the one that's popular today was actually popularized in 1980 in a book called A Quarter Century of Unix. And this goes as follows. So the first rule is write programs that do one thing and do it well, write programs to work together, and write programs to handle text streams because that is a universal interface. So this is the one that's fairly popular today, but it doesn't actually stop here. However, six years prior in 1974, Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson, two very important developers in the creation of Unix, actually wrote a paper on Unix and they had their own take on the Unix philosophy. So their first rule was make it easy to write, test and run programs, interactive use instead of batch processing, which sort of conflicts with one of Doug's rules, economy and elegance of design due to size constraints, so salvation through suffering, and self-supporting system, all Unix software is maintained under Unix. So while not entirely conflicting with what Doug said, it is kind of taking the Unix philosophy from a different approach. And they weren't the only ones to have their own take on the Unix philosophy. In 1997, Rob Pike in his paper Notes on C Programming had his own take on them. And his take is more, I guess, focused on algorithms and algorithm development. So his first rule is you can't tell where a program is going to spend its time 
Bottlenecks occur in surprising places, so don't try to second guess and put in a speed hack until you've proven that's where the bottleneck actually is. So what this effectively means is don't optimize until you know why you're optimizing. And this doesn't mean go and write bad code. What this means is, let's say you have, I don't know, a bunch of if statements and you think, okay, maybe if I clean up these if statements, it will massively speed up the application. But then you're forgetting about the fact that you also have this database query. And it's much more likely the database query is going to be a big speed improvement over the if statements. However, you don't actually know that that's the case until you go and test it. Secondly, measure, don't tune for speed until you've measured, and even then, don't unless one part of the code overwhelms the rest. So this sort of leans back into the first rule and is sort of saying, unless you know that part of the code base is really slowing the code down, there's not really any point to go and optimize it. You might as well go and work on something more productive. His third rule is fancy algorithms are slow when n is small, and n is usually small. Fancy algorithms have big constants. Until you know that n is frequently going to be big, don't get fancy. Even if n does get big, use rule 2 first. And a good example of this is with sorting algorithms. So obviously, a quick sort isn't the fastest way you can do a sort, especially on really big sets of data. Maybe a radix sort will be quicker. However, unless you know you're actually going to have big data sets and you know you're frequently going to have big data sets, there's no point actually going and putting in the work to implement the more complex algorithms if it's going to be slower on the low end. Fourth is fancy algorithms are buggier than simple ones and they're much harder to implement. Use simple algorithms as well as simple data structures. So really, don't overcomplicate the code base until you know that you actually have to to do some task. Fifth is data dominates. If you've chosen the right data structures and organized things well, the algorithms will almost always be self-evident. Data structures, not algorithms, are central to programming. So make sure your data is actually structured well, and then the algorithm to work with it should be very simple to do so. And the sixth rule is there is no sixth rule. And yes, that is actually one of the rules. So where does that take us then? Well, with all of those previous rule sets, as well as the actions of the Unix founding fathers, you can imply a further Unix philosophy, which would be better described as the true Unix philosophy. Because it's all well and good to say this is what the founding fathers said, but there might be further things implied by their actions as well. And one way to look at this is to break it down into 12 rules. So we have the rule of modularity, write simple parts connected by clean interfaces, the rule of clarity, clarity is better than cleverness, the rule of composition, design programs to be connected to other programs, the rule of separation, separate policy from mechanism, separate interfaces from engines. And one good example of this is looking at an application that has a graphical interface. So you wouldn't want to go and actually design all of the backend code directly in the UI because that's going to make it really difficult to, you know, put a new UI on there or go and modify the UI. Or one really common example you still see on Linux today is you have an application that has a server daemon and then you actually go and connect to that daemon with some sort of client and the daemon has no interest in the client whatsoever all it knows is that something has connected to it we have the rule of parsimony write a big program only when it is clear by demonstration that nothing else will do so keep it simple unless you absolutely have to do something that is massive we have the rule of transparency Design for visibility to make inspection and debugging easier. The rule of robustness. Robustness is the child of transparency and simplicity. So if you make it so the application is simple and the application is easy to debug, it will be a really strong application. We also have the rule of least surprise. In interface design, always do the least surprising thing. So if you're going to design an interface, stick with the standards. Don't try to do something fancy because you think it's going to be fancy. Make it so that people know how to use it and then it's going to be much easier to use. We also have the rule of silence. When a program has nothing surprising to say, it should say nothing. And this is why you see a lot of applications when they succeed, you don't get any output whatsoever. And on the flip side, we have the rule of repair. When you must fail, fail noisily and as soon as possible. So this is why a lot of Linux applications now, if they have some random configuration wrong with them, even though it might not be a problem on startup, it's going to be a problem down the line, so crash straight away so people know to fix it now. We also have the rule of economy. Programmer time is expensive, conserve it in preference to machine time. Now, a lot of people may disagree with one interpretation you can take from this, which is you should rely more on higher level languages because writing a program quickly is more important than making it so it's as quick as possible. But 
A lot of people are still reliant on things like C and C++ and don't really want to move away from those. So one other way you can interpret this is rely on things to do code generation and automated processes when possible. And that leads us into the next rule, which is the rule of generation. Avoid hand hacking, write programs to write programs when you can. So that sort of came from one of Rob Pike's rules. We have the rule of diversity, distrust all claims for one true way. So if there's an application that says, this is the only way that this can be done, this is the best way it can be done, distrust that. Don't believe that that's the only way it can be done because there probably is another way it can be done and there might even be a better way for it to be done as well. And the last rule we have is the rule of extensibility. Design for the future because it will be here sooner than you think. So that's a fairly good way to cap off the video and I'll leave a link to my sources down below so if you want to go and read more about this go ahead and do so because I had to cut a lot of content because I didn't want this to be like an hour, two hour video. So feel free to go check that out if you want to go explore more about it. So I think that's pretty much everything for me but before I go I would like to thank my supporters so a special thank you to Joachim, Corbinian, Andre Craig, Nathan, Montazar, Joseph, Peter D, Rode, Tony, Brennan, Donald, John, Marek, Mikkel, Nephite, Tease, and Zilva. If you want to go and support my work, there'll be some links down below to my subscribe star, my Patreon, my coin tree, and all of that sort of stuff. I've got a podcast called Tech Over T available basically anywhere. And I've also got this channel available on Library, BitTube, and BitChute as well, if you want to watch it on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and... Amen.